we've got co-authors of Client Earth here, Martin Goodman, who's written many books. I had a, I had a look at, at, at some of them and I'm tempted to read the next one about Bach that you wrote. So it's quite a wide selection. Um, and um, you're also Emeritus Professor of Creative Writing, is that right? That's right, at Howard, yes. Brilliant. Um, and James, founder, CEO of, of Client Earth. Thank you both so much for, for joining. Um, as I've, I think I've indicated to you, this we try and create, recreate kind of how a book club would be if we were all here in person, but we've only done it through lockdown. So it's all about a year old now, the book club. Um, so feel free to drink a glass of wine or um, say, I, I need a pause and I need to go and get something if, if needed. But I've got some questions to, to start you off. And then if it's like normal, we'll have tons of brilliant questions from, from our, um, our book club members and we'll, we'll see how we can go for the next hour and a half. So my, my standard first question, just to make sure in case somebody hasn't had the time to read it, and really you should, because it's very easy read actually, considering how much information that's in there. Would you just give us a quick intro, one of you to what the book is about? Um, what are the main tenets of it that it, we should start with as a base foundation for tonight? Over to you, James, on that one. Just a little introduction about what Client Earth is as well and how, this, how the book tells this story. I've started, in fact. <laughs> how the book tells yeah. the story of the growth of uh, environmental law as a not-for-profit movement. It started in the States in roughly 1970, 1970, 72, under the Nixon administration. And James was a pioneer of that movement in the United States with the group called NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. He took over um, the work of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, when, um, when Ronald Reagan came into power and tried to completely gut that of its power. So James went and then took the Clean Water Act that um, was, was again being completely sidelined and was the enforcer of that. So the book starts with that story, but really um, the book was, was prompted by the, the, the then chair of James's organization here in, based here in London called Client Earth, which is a not-for-profit environmental law firm. And this book charts the growth of that from just sort of the back bedroom um, of, of James and myself to what's now a global organization of 260 people, most of these, some of the very top lawyers in the world. And it's telling that story. And the idea really was to tell that story into Europe. This, the, the idea of people being able to use law to save the planet was fairly standard. It was a known thing in America, but over here in Europe, it wasn't known at all. So really it was to tell this story and the birth of, of this, this new organization to a European audience. And uh, that, that's how it came about. Anything to add to that, James? <clears throat> I mean, that's awfully good. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, can, can we do this together all the time? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, that was that was wonderful, and um, yeah, I, I saw that. Um, was it Winsome McIntosh who, who yes. encouraged yes, you to, to write it? And um, so she's based in London, is she? No, she's in uh, in in the states. Washington, okay, that's what. Yeah, Florida, no, no, that that, that 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 was my. Um, my well, well, and, we, we were just of the environmental movement and environmental law movement in the states. At the very beginning, they were they were some of the main backers of, of the NRDC when it when it, mm. when it founded, and other other big players in the movement. So her, her herself and her husband were real pioneers of, of this whole organization. And and the way they got into that, which is interesting and relates to what Martin was saying, uh, is that uh, in the United States there was, uh, you know, there was apartheid uh, in, uh, and then in the '60s they didn't call it that, but it was that. Uh, and then in, in the 60s, you had the civil rights movement. Um, and uh, lawyers got deeply involved in the civil rights movement because if you're a person of color asserted your rights, you'd get arrested. So lawyers had to get you out of jail. And then they became more and more deeply involved in the movement and started uh, doing strategy uh, in the movement and then started conceiving of legislation to get things changed like the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and very successful uh, combination of activists uh, and activist lawyers. And then what happened in the, in the US was that um, you had the uh, environmental movement come just after that. Martin was saying uh, 
you know, in the 70s, this, 1970 or so, this use of law started in the US. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, so the Macintoshes, uh, Winsome being our chair for the first 10 years, uh, and the Rockefellers, who were their friends, who were funding the civil rights movement, said, hold on, the environmental movement is going to be as controversial in its way as the civil rights movement uh, has been. So we better get lawyers in there from the beginning. So we, because we saw it, it worked very well. So they uh, funded several groups of young, at that time, very young lawyers uh, to use their brains to try and defend the environment and the people who were, who were defending the environment. And my theory is that the, the reason there, were, there weren't any lawyers uh, in a coordinated way working across Europe for the environment when I got here 20 years ago or so, was that uh, there was never a need for the civil rights movement in the mm -hmm. EU in the same way that there was in the US. So the environmental movement went in the direction of um, uh, campaigning and people became very expert campaigners uh, and policy people. But uh, while that is very important, uh, for me, it wasn't the complete picture. You know, I, I see you do that and mm -hmm. you have legal strategy and then everything, you know, is potentiates itself and is, is much more powerful. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I'm going to come to. I have I have a ton of questions myself, and I can see them already popping up on the on the chat about the work in particular. But I want to just dig in, take a moment, and talk about the book. Um, mm. On you know how was it writing it together, um, especially being married. You know, you know, did was there anything that surprised you, Martin, that you didn't know already when you when you wrote this book and when you did the research? Yeah, I was surprised that James hadn't been telling tall stories all along. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. He really thought I did. He would say, that's not true. That's not true. And th then, he, then he went and researched it all. <laughs> so I, I had to source everything he'd been saying through all the years, all the tales. It was interesting. <laughs> yeah. you know? So I was finding all, all of the things. So that, that was one thing just in a... In a well, I, I got such points out of this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> But um, no, the, the drama of the story was there. For me, I understand something by, by telling it as a story. So mm. I, I, I'd been there, obviously, we have hours of conversation every day about Clyde Earth and the formation of Clyde Earth and how it works. It's, it, it's, what, it's what we do at home. Uh, but then having to grasp it all as, as a narrative story was, was a very interesting process and see, seeing how it worked in that way. And uh, for me as well, it was interesting to, I thought when I started the book that I was going to be embedded inside Client Earth and it would be a fly on the wall do documentary type of book. Uh, but then I came to recognize that lawyers were not, con were not happy at all with, with that situation because okay. l lawyers actually wanted their things to be secret. You know, we, we mustn't share this with anybody. You know? And uh, so then I recognized that you had to go wider and see the whole wealth of everybody that would belong to this. So the lawyers that actually were willing to take part, the very much into the, 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 the main players in civil society. So I went out to Poland and was meeting, meeting the farmers' wives who were there and their farms would be lost if the power, power plants were built. And going with the lawyers who were meeting these players for the first time and, um, and meeting all of these, uh, the civil society activists in Africa. In, in Ghana. So it was interesting just, and, and then also the philanthropists going out with the philanthropists and the, the fish enforcement officers and, and the people that were finding the benefits of law in their lives. And also the, the, the businessmen, the bankers, the entrepreneurs who were needing more regulation coming into their lives. So it was really recognizing there was a whole family. So that was one of the interesting things that, were, that came about from it all. And then it was really working out how to tell the story together. So we interleave things. I'm, I'm a storyteller. Well, James is actually a real storyteller too. That's how much of Client Earth was formed by his, his talking it into existence, into telling stories early on. But um, I built the narrative out of personalities really, personalities and their commitments and their stories. Um, we decided early on that we would build a narrative of hope, but a tagline for the book is that it's an evidence-based narrative of hope. So James being a lawyer often came in with more evidence. So he interleaved chapters uh, that were more authoritative in a way. I, I'm telling a story and, and then, wow, here comes a little bit of a punch and, and, and James is you know, framing around each of the narratives. So we, we found that we worked together 
in that way by finding different takes and different angles. How did it work for you, Louise, that intermingling of two voices? But that, but that was what I was going to say, because I think it's a it's a rare mix of being very factual and telling some, some you know, quite heavy hitting stories you might read in the newspaper, actually, but in this beautiful way. Um, and it kind of I, I wrote it down as I was writing my questions and it kind of oozes love, actually, both <laughs> for James as the protagonist, but also for the, the other people. And you talked about them, the farmers, wives, the businessmen, the people who are involved and and that I thought and, and for the planet. Um, but I thought that was that was one of the most enjoyable pieces of, of, of the book, actually, was that sense. Um, yeah, that you've managed to mix facts and love, which I kind mm. of. From a it's wonderful how about. much people are doing to save the planet. I, I, I wasn't doing it, I was just writing a book and I wasn't telling my story. I, I was going out and finding other people's stories. So the book is woven from other people's stories. I didn't know them when I started out. So that for me was, that for me was a very exciting, encouraging thing to, to do. Mm. Thanks for that, really thinking it's about love. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, that, that, that's sort of when I had to distill it. Um, and did you sort of when you went out and, and, and interviewed, so you said there were people who didn't want to be part, um, were there any you chose not to interview? Or, you know, where, where James said, oh, here's a, here's a story you might want to look at. And then for some reason you decided not to. Is there anything that's, you know, on the cutting um, room floor? So yeah, there are, there's a few things on the cutting room floor. And uh, there's, I suppose, I suppose one of the things that was interesting at the beginning was that when James, being frank, when James was starting out with, with Clyde Earth in this country, in, in, in Europe, there was hostility. Um, it, was, it was seen as the, the American pretender, the new kid on the block. There was, they were deemed to be very well funded. I, I knew, in fact, because we were, I, I actually took, I, I had to, I left London to take a job as a lecturer in Plymouth because that was the only salary we could actually work. So I was supporting myself uh -huh. on that. But because we had named American backers, we were seen to be seen as being sort of very wealthy. And um, so, and there was a sense, what well, more or less, I mean, a very stated sense amongst um, the, the, the established environmental community, that lawyers should um, kind of Come in, come in and support role um, when called upon by the environmental movement. The idea of lawyers then coming in and leading on strategy was anathema and, um, and actually horrible. <laughs> and so there, it, was, it was actually very contentious. So I, I chose to interview one of those lawyers and his story then, I, I needed something of that other side in the book, but I didn't go for the welter of that other side. And right. that could have been that. And there were also some people that I spoke to within Client Earth that, that were telling me, it went on a kind of a, a negative flow. And I thought, well, right. honestly, I, why should I bother to put, like, I'm trying to write a st positive story of hope. <laughs> but I was also taking on, but I was taking on the challenges. How will we deal with China? How will we deal with corruption in Africa? They were the big things, the big issues that I wanted to deal with. And I, and I felt they, they had to be confronted and they, they were confronted, but happily they even came out positives for me. But that was it. I was trying to, um, to, to, to write a positive story, but make sure that the, the gainsayers all had their voice in it. But mm. I, I, I had my control of the, on the volume button. <laughs> you know? Yeah, as, a, as, a, as an author should, I guess. <laughs> yes. And was there, was there anything you would have liked to have seen in there, James? Or are you just happy with how it was? It's obviously been really successful, but anything else? I well, I mean, uh, I, you know, it won't surprise you to, for, to hear from me that I think Martin is a great writer. But, uh, the, um, but he is. And, <clears throat> you know, and I tell stories all the time. And he's right that I... The clean earth exists because I tell stories, you know, and that's uh, what I think the primary function of people is really telling stories. Um, and um, uh, uh, what surprised me was that I was learning all kinds of stories that I didn't know uh, from from the book. And uh, I'd never met the Polish farmers. And, uh, and I, I mean, I knew that we were working with Polish farmers, but I'd never been there and met them. And in fact, some of these meetings happened uh, because Martin said, I, I would like to meet some some of the people you're representing. Uh, and um, and the lawyer said, well, some of these people we work with from a distance, you know, uh, uh, over email, and we've never met them. So let's go out and meet them, you know. So so there was this whole set of human relationships that started as a result of the book, from which I think we learned a lot. Oh, I can imagine. Um, moving sort of slightly on, um, you've got, in, at least in the version I've got, there's a little postscript with about Trump coming into power. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
if there was um, sort of any chapter, I guess one additional chapter that, that between when it was written and now that you would add, what would that be about? Well, um, we mentioned <laughs> we went to Winter McIntosh at the very beginning and uh, we were in touch with it today uh, because uh, we're going to be doing a new Spanish version of the book. So we've been thinking about exactly that because we're opening an office in Madrid uh, and uh, a group of Spanish donors said, gee, if we could have a Spanish um, version yeah. of the book, uh, you know, it would really help us raise money for the charity. So we said, well, that's an interesting opportunity. So uh, the two that we're going to do are one on um, the work in Spain and the Mediterranean on protecting biodiversity, uh, yes. which uh, is uh, important work that we're doing. And, um, and the other would be an update on Asia, because so much has happened since the current uh, edition of the book came out and you know, the, the work in Asia has really, really taken off. And I, at some point today, um, I would love to share some of that with you, but it's, uh, those would be the two things rather than the one, one, one at the beginning, one at the end. <laughs> no, no, that makes complete sense. Um, it's very, and, for me, it's actually yeah. very interesting. You, you get the, the, um, the air quality story. And the idea of that was that if it, it's, it's a long arc of a story, um, which I'll, I, I won't go into, but what really has impressed me is that, that very notion that if you can win a, a case in one, in, in one court um, within the EU, and this was, we were all within the EU at this point, then that effect will ripple out. So I, I've been really impressed how what the genesis of what we're talking about in the book, which was cleaning air in Europe, and, and, and attacking fossil fuels and attacking diesel. And this idea of diesel particulates and, and, and needing, to, needing to remove them from our place. Mm. This was actually part of James's story. I think James was a, was a great power in, in getting that story embedded in London, certainly and then winning that Supreme Court case. And it is astonishingly wonderful how the team of lawyers um, throughout Europe uh, for Clyde Earth have actually, and, and, and partner organizations, have gone and carried that throughout Europe. So there really is now hope of our breathing clean air uh, and how you know, coal power station after coal, coal fired power station has tumbled in Europe. So we can see the, we begin to see the end of, of coal fired uh, power stations in Europe. So I, I think it's you know, the, the origin of all of these stories is there and the early fruits but the fact that there have been so many rich crops of fruit come come year after year from from those same stories has been really wonderful so it'd be, it'd be lovely to be able to tell those stories again yes because now we've we've matured to the point where there with like 260 staff where um i mean when the book was finished we had because uh, we've been growing about 20 percent a year uh and uh, uh a year on year on year and um, since lockdown started we've added over 100 people um, you know, to the organization. Uh, so I know all these people, uh, all of these remarkable characters only by, uh, you know, screen uh, meetings at this point. And we have these, these things that come through almost every day now, big recent developments in Japan, in China, you know, um, in Pakistan, places where we weren't even working some of them uh, in, until recently. And, uh, you know, um, uh, Martin's right about the air quality. So, but that was a, a good illustration of, of uh, strategic thinking really. So the idea was, uh, with that very early air quality case, uh, since nobody had enforced environmental law, um, uh, at the very beginning, I needed to figure out a case that we could bring. Uh, and we do more than cases. We write, we're in the Brussels Parliament all the time, writing legislation and Parliament in London, that kind of thing. But cases are a lot of fun. So um, so we, we needed to uh, figure out a, a case that would demonstrate that citizens could enforce environmental law in Europe because people weren't doing it. Mm -hmm. And then it had to be about something real, so it was meaningful. Um, and that turned out to be air quality because air was killing so many people in Europe, which was a big surprise to me, you know, coming to Europe as an American naive uh, Europhile, thinking that everything was pretty, pretty cool. And there were a lot of Perfect. people dying, dying of air pollution, 400,000 a year. So I uh, brought the case in the UK and the hope was that we would get it up to the win in the Supreme Court, which we did. Then it would go to the European Court, which it did that we'd get a good ruling and then we could bring it everywhere. So immediately when we got the good ruling in the European court, uh, we went to Germany, which is the heart of the uh, diesel motor industry, 
which yes. uh, and diesel motors are really what's uh, killing everyone with air pollution. So we instantly filed uh, suits in 10 places in Germany, including Stuttgart, Dusseldorf, Munich, homes of Mercedes, uh, Porsche, BMW, Volkswagen, and we won. Um, and uh, we got the judges to prohibit uh, diesel vehicles from going into the center of the cities, which completely freaked out the German motor companies. And um, what was interesting is that they were really attached to these diesel uh, engines because they were making a lot of money off them. The Chinese were ahead uh, working on electric vehicles and remain ahead. Uh, <clears throat> but by getting the diesel banned, uh, what we managed to do is to, then we started, uh, people started to go uh, away from buying diesel. So the, um, uh, the economy started moving away from diesel. 25% reduction in diesel sales in Germany uh, within the following year, according to Green Fleet Magazine, a magazine I'd never heard of, which is uh, oh, me neither. Industry, industry magazine. Now, uh, but I have to give them a plug because in that year, uh, uh, they, um, uh, they rate the 10 people in the world who uh, are moving uh, the world towards uh, green vehicles. And... Uh, uh, that year, uh, Elon Musk was number eight and I was number six. And it was uh, uh, <laughs> the only time in the world <laughs> that I'll ever beat Elon Musk on anything, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but, but what's cool is that it shows that these things all link up so that if you're thinking strategically, you can say, uh, how can I bring something that will help people or in the environment uh, that will demonstrate that citizens everywhere can do this um, it, with a well-constructed mm -hmm. strategy and game and that it can then have a big economic impact uh, and take on the big goal of moving society in the right direction when it comes to sustainability. And that one case or series of cases illustrates all those things. Yeah, and, and for me, one of the words that, and I, I mentioned this to you when you spoke yesterday, but there's something about how you leverage things um, and that it seems that that's how your, your brain kind of, um, attack things is where where is the piece of leverage one of the, the sort of little notes I, I first made in the book uh, sort of on the book was you know getting companies to pay an annual fee to the NRDC just to to know what was coming next um, which again is is doing one thing and then having a disproportionately um, a positive effect on other things sort of down the road and I just I, I would love to hear actually I'm I want to first test Martin whether am I right on this? Does does James leverage everything, <laughs> or is this just in when he's looking at cases and law? Because because it just seems to me these kind of very clear sighted, you know, this this method five steps for for systems shift that we you know we talked about. You know, you start with the science, then you go to policy, lawmaking, you know, implementation, enforcement, and and off we go starting with one case looking at where's the easy not the easiest but where's the right place to start in order to have um, a bigger effect than you could is do you do that and does he do that in every sort of aspect of life yeah probably <laughs> <laughs> i think he does he, he's uh, it's interesting living with a litigator and um, and, and, a, and a top lawyer in that way because he, he just takes this vast brief it's this universal brief out there. It, it goes as wide as he can, and, and it's lots of information sources. So he, he's doing that and refining, refining all the time. And, um, and then always he'll be seeing, well, actually, does he do it all the time? Well, yeah, I'll take that in a minute. But uh, always he'll then be seeing what attacks might be coming in uh, and then how, how that might be defended. And, but always is refining it and refining things down. So everything just becomes very simple by the time he says something. But, but, but you've seen this sort of cloudscape of, of this milestone going inside his head when he's doing all of this work. And then it's simple. And then he knows he's won. You know, but, but it's actually all the battles, all the cases, all, all of the arguments, they've all been played there before, before, before we hear it, before we see it. The thing about sort of friendly, friendly at home was that there is that film about the um, the Teflon thing with um, Mark Ruffalo. Oh, yes, um, yes, I can't remember what it's called, but I Dark Waters, I think. Dark uh, Waters, yeah. Dark Waters. Well, well, it's a Saturday night movie, and and then I just had James utterly depressed for three days afterwards because <laughs> this was an injustice. He couldn't get in there and fit and and, and, and fit. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm learning how much injustice is something that just upsets him enormously. And the interesting thing about the, the planet and him 
being and all of his team being lawyers for the planet um, is that they're fighting what many of us might have thought was uh, an impossible battle. How do we battle against this death of our planet? And, 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 uh, and uh, well, it's, it's because he's actually got this team of lawyers now, he, he, he almost feels he can do it because you can actually strategize and you can always be combating and compete. Com, you know, you're, you're, in, you're in there and you're fighting. So justice can still be won, even though the odds are intolerable, intolerable against you. And uh, so that's part of that's part of living with James. He's, he's an intense guy, <laughs> but he's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so that you've actually answered because one of my questions was going to be, you know, I think somewhere in the book it talks about purposeful action comes from passion, and some of the most uh, the best creative efforts uh, come from getting annoyed. Mm -hmm. And I was going to check in on is it is it sort of passion is in love and um or is it annoyance and anger but you've just answered it that it's injustice is is a key motivator is right? yes it is because i mean for james it's loving the planet so much and getting really angry with anybody that's doing it so love and anger are, are the poles of it all <laughs> and then then the guy is there fighting what he then deems to be injustice and uh, mm. yeah no, that makes sense um and i want to pick up on one thing you said James, because you, you talked about it being fun to do cases and, and the beginning of the book is very much you, you know, researching, figuring out how, how, to, uh, how to run these cases in partnerships, but really very much on you. And now you're the CEO of 260 people in five, six offices across the, the world. How do you balance that? Are you, are you feeling agitated that you're not doing as many cases as you'd like or what's going on there? Well, um, the... Uh... Not agitated. Um, it, it took me a while to to step back a bit, and um, uh, but now I get to. Uh, there's a, a word we used to use in, in New York called kibitz. I get to kibitz, you know, and uh, look over the shoulder of all of my uh, lawyers and say, "What about this? What about this?" And then um, I am an entrepreneur rather than a you know rather than a, a CEO. I, that's something I, I have to be a CEO. You have got to do all these other things in order to get to the place mm -hmm. you want to go. It's part of the strategy. And I didn't want to be a CEO. I wanted to save the planet. So, uh, you know, you have to do that along the way. And I'm looking forward in about a year to moving into the, the role of, uh, you know, founder or president, something like that, uh, when I can concentrate on the strategy, fundraising, communications, and hand over the, um, the CEO uh, stuff, because I have these uh, tremendously talented group of people, uh, several of whom would be great at that. Uh, so I, I look forward to getting back to that, but uh, the but I've never really given it up. So we uh, uh, we started in the UK and then uh, immediately, uh, well, pretty close, uh, went to Brussels and then went to Warsaw so that we could have a real Europe-wide organization. Um, and because I thought with like no no people and no money, uh, twenty eight countries was enough to start with. That was my that mm -hmm. was the idea. Uh, but then we got a feeling for that. Um, the uh, the idea was always to go uh, bigger, and um, so uh, uh, now we're in uh, five African countries. China, we're about to open in Singapore to work on Southeast Asia. We're setting up uh, an entity in Australia, and we've uh, we've got uh, uh, something going in the U.S. as well. We just hired our first securities litigator there, and all of those things are exactly the type of entrepreneurial operation that, that I love. So. Um, and China has been has been great in that regard. I well, during the whole time I was setting up the European thing, I was thinking, how am I ever going to get into China? You know, uh, we've got to do something in China. Um, and, um, and then I got invited to uh, to go and give a seminar to members of the Supreme Court of China, uh, the head uh, number two guy at the Ministry of Environment, and the head of the uh, Committee on Environment in the People's Congress. Um, and that turned into this marvelous experience in China. And the reason why is that they were um, uh, writing a law to allow Chinese NGOs, so Chinese citizen, environmental citizen groups, to uh, sue polluting companies, including those owned by the state. And they invited me in and said, you know, you're the only person that we could find who, who's done this work in, on two continents. You've done this in Europe, you've done it in America. If anybody understands what the building blocks are, of a system that will work, uh, it's you. So what are the building blocks? And I said, well, actually there are six. Now, before we get into the details, I just wanna say, cause here I am in Beijing. It's my first time in Beijing. 
where, you know, behind closed doors with all of these senior, senior, senior people, I have four members of the Supreme Court and these other smart people. And, um, and I said, but before we get into the six points, you know, uh, building blocks, I just have to say, this is uh, wonderful what you're doing. You know, it's, uh, it's revolutionary. And the, uh, uh, to allow citizens to sue state-owned companies. And the senior Supreme Court judge said, James, uh, forgive me uh, for stopping you there, but uh, you know, revolutionary is a big word for us here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes. So we had a good laugh and I thought I could, I could work with these people. And then we, um, then we had our seminar and they said, gee, that's really helpful. And then we exchanged information uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, by email. I went back in three months. And I was then meeting in the Supreme Court building, you know, 40 foot long white marble table, amazingly big building, building the side of Guilford. You know, this is, this is China. Mm -hmm. And, um, they, uh, and the, the senior judge said, well, before we get going, you just need to know that all the work you sent to us was ex so exactly what we wanted, that we took it and we wrote it directly into the Chinese law. And I'm thinking, wow. gee, what's going on here? So I put my hand on my heart, literally, I, this is not, normal. I put my hand on my heart and I said, Your Honor, not every meeting starts like this for me, <laughs> you know, and then then we had a laugh, you know, and he said, good. So now what do you want to do for China? And I thought, I said, well, last time I was here, I discovered that you had just, China had just appointed 3,000 environment court judges. Incredible. I mean, there are no environment court judges in the UK. Uh, no. There, I mean, Sweden has a very tiny little group. Um, that's it in Europe. Uh, there's a small group in Australia. Uh, that's pretty much it. So globally, not much. China had just appointed 3,000 environment court judges because they decided they wanted pretty good laws, but not well enforced. And they wanted to bring enforcement up to like a European standard. Uh, uh, so I said, I mean, it just popped into my head. I said, well, I mean, what do you want? You want to know what I want to do? Well, those judges all need training. This is new stuff. You've set them up. That's great, but they all need training. He said, you couldn't be more right. Will you train them? <laughs> and I said, so, gee, you know, but you have to, you know, be quick on your feet. So I said, sure, uh, but where will I start? I've never trained a judge. I was going through my head. What do I, what do, I do? How do I train a judge? I'll figure it out later. Don't worry. Uh, you know, so I said, where do I start? And he said, with us. And I said, really, with the Supreme Court, <laughs> what, what do you want to learn? And he said, well, you know, we know that you're one of the top experts globally on climate litigation. So we want you to come back and give us a seminar on climate litigation. I said, well, sure, gladly. But what's the thought behind the question? Just so I know, so I can prepare. Like, why do you want to know about that? And he said, well, uh, because we want to know the best cases going on in the world because we want to decide the world's best cases to protect the climate. And I'm thinking this is getting more and more remote from how the China is perceived in the West. Uh, here I'm sitting with members of the Supreme Court of China saying they want to decide the world's best cases to stop climate change. Now, if I did get to talk to the UK Supreme Court uh, without suing somebody or the French Supreme Court or God knows the US Supreme Court, this is not the conversation you'd be having. So I went back with you know, a bunch of experts and we gave this seminar. And after that, they said, well, we really love this. Uh, and uh, at the dinner we had the evening and, you know, this day will go down in our history book to the senior judge. And I thought, well, that's polite. It's the sort of thing you say at a cocktail party and, you know, a garden party in the summer in the UK. So I said, oh, well, that's very nice. It'll go down in my history book too. Um, you know, and then I realized, hmm, probably not the right thing to say, but he said, no, no, you misunderstand. Um, we do have a Supreme Court history book and it goes back a very, very long way. Oh, wow. And, and we've never invited a foreign expert to give a seminar uh, to the Supreme Court judges in the Supreme Court building before. That's a mark of our respect for you. And I thought, wow, something's really happening here. And they said, well, we'd like you to train the other judges now that we know you. So then we've been training these judges for four or five years now. Uh, and we've trained, oh, well, 1,500 or so. And then the prosecutors came to us after the judges uh, training after a year and the number two prosecutor for all of China uh, and said, the judges love what they're getting. You know, in that law you helped write, as you know, 
we got the right to sue the Chinese government for the first time uh, on behalf of the people, like when the environment department isn't doing its job to clean up the water in Yunnan or something. Could you train us? Could you train us? Because you sue governments all the time, you always win, to sue the Chinese government. I'm like, wow, being asked to train judges is one thing. Being asked by the federal prosecutors in China to train them to sue the Chinese government, I thought like I'd as science fiction. So sure, I said, and we, we went and trained them. And boy, that's really taken off. So you have all these environment judges waiting for work and the prosecutors decided to really give them work. So we showed them how to put together environmental cases and I brought in prosecutors from around the world and I gave seminars and I said, you know, the, here's your strategy. Uh, your highest leverage is, back to leverage, your highest leverage is going to be if you sue government entities, you can sue all the companies in the world, uh, you know, but let's focus on the government and bring your cases against government entities because one government entity can then go after a thousand companies, you know, mm. uh, that they should be enforcing. So that's where you leverage it. And they really listened. So after the first year, uh, we said to them, um, you know, how did it go? Let's do a little audit. And the number two prosecutor said uh, to the head of the Beijing office, we're very disappointed, you know, um, we've been we've been trying, but we just haven't, we haven't, lived up to our own standards. And he said, well, what have you done? They figured they were gonna do 500 cases. And he said, well, we've only initiated 100,000 cases. 100,000. 100,000? Yeah. Uh, and they'd settled 90%, something like that, uh, favorably and, and got cleanup and everything. Um, and then the question was how many of them were against government entities? And the answer was, oh, a little more than 70%. Wow. Yeah. And then, uh, so about five weeks ago, we got a letter uh, with a red script, the imperial red script across the top. And I'm told oh. uh, when, when you get a letter from the prosecutors in China, you quake, uh, but uh, I, that, that would make sense. But um, this letter was the first letter we've gotten from them in this way. And it was hand delivered by a prosecutor. And it's, a, it's like two page, beautiful letter. And it says, thank you for introducing environmental prosecutions uh, uh, on, on behalf of the public to China. This year, we have added another 80,000 cases. Uh, and uh, that's due to our work with you. We are so grateful to this partnership. Please let us work together to keep saving the planet. And you think, wow, you know, this is so cool. This is so I, cool. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I, yeah, were you not expecting it to be, a, I was going to say, a warrant for your arrest? <laughs> <laughs> cool. uh, yeah. Uh, no, but it's um, it was so unexpected. This door we fell through, you know, and so it's uh, you know, it's it's about love. So you, you go there and you're trying to do something. You know, I went there because I had, you know, I I had fairly small expectations of what was going to happen, um, but I thought it was pretty great. To, the question they were asking was pretty great for the, the seminar, and then everything else just came from it, and it came because of the senior judge uh, said because of the personal uh, belief that those connections generated you know they said we 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 want to work with you personally and then in that meeting with the, at the 40 foot long table uh, the person i was with was the head of the eu environment program in china uh who had been the conduit for my initial invitation so the two of us were sitting there and the senior judge said oh and by the way james we want to work with you personally um and you know and we love working with dimitri uh uh, we really trust Dimitri and his EU program is ending. So it would really facilitate us working with you if you hired Dimitri and set up a Beijing office. Uh, so Dimitri and I looked at each other and said, well, uh, gee, that's kind of like being married by the Supreme Court of China, yeah, you know, so let's get together. And, and it's been a beautiful partnership. Uh, and, uh, and so this, you know, one thing led to another and it was all due to being there, being in the flow really. Uh, and then doing what was needed. Yeah. That's a wonderful story and actually impactful more than just a wonderful story. The, so I've, I've been seeing things fly in through the, the chat, but if you said the word flow, which makes me want to kind of pick back up on um, what you mentioned in the book about your meditation practice. And and I saw that Teen, who's um, one of our very regulars, she says that, a thank you for the book but 
what she sees is in it is perspective, process and precision. And she would love if you would share a bit more about your meditation practice and how it has created perspective and space so that you can choose the correct process, um, and which then leads you to operate with such precision um, and ensure sort of meaningful and enforceable law and policy that's worth all that effort. Mm -hmm. And I want to add and, and be in that flow because presumably some, some of your meditative practices will, um, will help that, that flow kind of occur. Would you talk a little bit to that for us? Well, yes, but first let me uh, ask from Martin's perspective, because uh, Martin is my Sangha, you know, I'm a, I'm a Zen Buddhist and, uh, you know, the, uh, one has a Sangha uh, and, you know, we've been um, in a, uh, well, he's been my Sangha for a very long time now, but, but particularly in lockdown, I was getting lazy about um, meditating, um, but uh, you can't be if you live with Professor Dr. Goodman. So, uh, so, so Martin, what, what's first, what are your thoughts on this? Yes, please. I'll, I'll be passing it back to you very soon, this one, I think. But f for me, the, the necessity is there just to get a separation from the, uh, the plague of worries and, and offenses and, and, and attacks and concerns, especially, especially now. So that's why I was offering you know, this, this bedrock, okay, now is the time we must sit down and, and, and meditate before we move on into the day. And, um, and the, you know, the question I, I can see is, you know, I, I was building this, uh, this notion of, of James being out there in this maelstrom and all of that, but also, you know, I think the, the meditative side of James, you know, you asked about no, you're bringing in the Zen side of James now. J James has a, a Zen name. I'm becoming a Buddhist priest. You know, you're given a name. His name is Soshin. Soshin translates as essence of the essence, and uh, and, and it's, it, was, it was given to him by his his teacher, um, Maizumi Roshi. And I think that's really what's happening in that process. You know, we, you, you've got this chaos and, and the clamor, and you're quieting it down quite a bit. Until until that essence of the essence comes through, and until you, you've stilled things, okay, this this is important, and now uh, let's move that forward. So, so I, I think whatever's going to come out of the day is clarified by that moment of, you know, by the, that time of sitting in meditation, and uh, so the clamor goes away, and, and there's a certain purity that then comes through, and then the action stems out of that quiet time. Does that does that seem right, James? No, I, that's absolutely right. Um, and, um, you know, for me, it, it is really what's gotten me through life. I mean, uh, you know, although I, I tell uh, the, the stories about what's fun uh, in, uh, in this work, uh, it, it's also, uh, you know, it's not an easy path. So, um, uh, and it's, it's meditation and relationship with Martin that have gotten me through all these, these many years. And the meditation is enormously important. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I found myself melting down in my 30s when I was running 60 cases. I mean, I had never brought a case before and I started out by filing 60 at once uh, to, um, to stop pollution. And I figured that's how I'd learn about how to do it if I did all of that. And, and I, I did learn about it, but um, I found myself melting down and, um, and also not knowing what life was about, you know? And I'd, I'd, uh, I'd studied Western philosophy and I'd had a relationship that ended and I was doing all of these cases, and none of those things had actually given me the deep sense of connectedness and purpose that I was looking for. So why am I actually alive? What am I here for? Um, and uh, so much so that I, there was a time, 3.30 in the morning, one morning, I found myself staring in the bathroom mirror, repeating my essentially name, rank, and serial number. You know, And I, I watched myself doing that, thinking, this is really interesting. I wonder if uh, this is what uh, is, is meant by uh, you know, a, a breakdown. Uh, this, is, this is fascinating. Um, and I thought, well, what, what, what can I um, think of next? And the only thing I could think of was Zen. Um, so I read uh, a lot. And then I found uh, uh, there was a, an American writer called Peter Matheson, whose work I liked very much. Mm -hmm. And he later became a friend. Uh, and uh, he became a Zen master. And anyway, his Zen journey was in a book. And uh, reading that, and I trusted him from his writing, took me to this Japanese Zen master in California, who um, was one of the people who brought Zen from Japan to the West in the 
in the 60s. Just a small group of people who did. So, um, so I left New York and moved to California and moved into the Zen Center um, I, before I knew much about Zen um, and lived there the whole time that I was founding the Los Angeles office of, of the NRDC. And um, you know, it became a very, very serious practice for me and, uh, and remains so. And, the, and um, clarifying. So one way to, I mean, I'll give you two different things. One way um, to think about it is when you're trying to, I find, do something, whether it's uh, about a law case or about anything in life, um, what I do is I do all of the research, you know. Uh, so I go for all of the uh, all of the facts and try and sort through the facts, and that's intuitive plus rational. And then if there are rules involved, like in law, you know, you study them, and that's both intuitive and rational. Um, and then you know, what's the what's the outcome? Where where do I go to get my outcome? Where do I go yeah. to get my leverage? Where do I stand? That's my jumping off point. How do I get to the end of the diving board? And that's seldom obvious. Um, mm. So um, what I then do is take all of that and then meditate um, and um, let it sit. And sometimes it takes a long time. Uh, there's an example in the book uh, of that where, oh, no, sorry, that's in my book on meditation. Forget that. Uh, it's another, in the book as well. another interesting book. It is in the end. The nutcatcher story is in the book. Oh, it's in the book. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And the meditation is in there too. So uh, I was uh, trying to figure out uh, a very complex problem. Um, and uh, I was sitting with it in the way I just described. And then the, the, um, uh, the answer emerged uh, in the image of a bird. And I said, okay, what is that bird? And then it turned out when I did the research, it was the California gnatcatcher, a small endangered species, which then we went about protecting and then achieved our mission of protecting a huge part of the California coast. But that's a marvelous example of um, how the preparation and then the openness um, allowed the opportunity for the world to speak uh, in the meditation and actually direct me in this, in this, very, very, uh, in this very, very clear way. Um, a completely different example is how to detach from um, the um, from what psychologists call perseveration. Now, this um, this thing I have about injustice and I get angry, you know, that's that's the psyche that I have to deal with. So, um, and uh, perseveration is when uh, it's like the, you, you're strapped to a Catherine wheel, you know, and uh, you get in this negative thought pattern and it's very hard to get out. It's very, very hard to get out. So how do you break that? Actually, walking in nature is one way. It's, that's really good. Um, but uh, sometimes that doesn't quite do it. So I started um, a couple of years ago when I realized that Trump was stealing my energy like a vampire. Um, and I said, well, I, he's not going to get away with that. You know, I can beat this. How do I beat this? Um, and the answer was to try the ancient practice of loving kindness. So in loving kindness practice, I see some heads going up and down. Um, it's a it's a really simple and incredibly powerful. And uh, if you look it up, you'll get the the the, the, the directions. And it's it's really simple. Um, uh, and it's basically you take someone as may they be happy, healthy, safe, and free, and you concentrate on them, and you really mean it. You know, or you try to really mean it. Um, and uh, I went. I thought, well, I'll do that with Donald Trump. Um, and I have to tell you, at the height of Donald Trump's power, uh, sending him love and kindness was not easy for me. You know, <laughs> it just, <laughs> it was one of the harder meditation things I've ever done. Um, but I thought, good, that's hard. Let me go there. Um, that's always an indication of where there may be either blockage or leverage. Where it's hard, let me go there. So, um, so I went there and I spent a lot of time on it. And then what I started uh, feeling was um, a freedom from that, from his ability to drain my batteries. Mm -hmm. um, so I started feeling a, a distance and the distance was actually introduced by this love and kindness practice. Um, so uh, ultimately, although I was sending love and kindness to a person who was a very difficult person, essentially what I was doing, I discovered was uh, doing love and kindness for myself, therefore freeing myself 
to be able to use my energy for the good stuff that I wanted to be focused on. Um, and so those are, those are different examples of how I use meditation practice, but it's really important for me. And you know, I'm doing it all day long in different ways. And the, w one of the things is you, those of you who are doing it will know mm -hmm. is that you develop this sense of being able to watch yourself at all times. Um, and uh, you're able to scan, where am I going? What am I thinking about? You know, am I moving in the right direction? And those intuitions become, become stronger in a, in a very helpful way. And also it, when people are exploding at you, when that happens, um, it gives you the opportunity of, with, with effort, of just going very wide, you know, and letting it blow through, um, which sometimes produces a, a good transformation in the, in the person that you're in, encountering. Uh, so I, I suppose that's a third way, you know, uh, but, uh, but those are examples of how, uh, I mean, it, it really is central to my, um, to my practice of law. Right. And they, I mean, it's interesting, you know, that you talk about practicing the piano, uh, practicing medicine, practicing law, practicing meditation. Um, and they really all are practices in, in a very similar way of uh, attention directed towards something that's positive. You know? Yeah. Oh, I see. Carrie says life is a practice. She's just popped up on my <laughs> screen. Um, and I think it was also Carrie who said she's also sent some love and kindness to Trump on occasion, which I think he really needed at the time, right? And we all really needed. Yep. Um, um, I'm just seeing, I can see Tamsin has just um, popped up a quick question. Um, so what is it saying here? We've hold, hosted a conversation about how do you organize around love, not anger, and, and kind of hold or hold sort of righteous anger um, for justice. Um, and then Zoe has one that adds perfectly, which is around could you talk a little bit about the culture at Client Earth and, you know, sort of loving kindness practice? D is, does that permeate the organization? And especially if you've just grown quite substantially, how mm. do you? How do you have that um, permeate through a now virtual organization across the world? Well, um, a really good question. And, um, you know, Martin was talking early on in, in our discussion today about how uh, some of the lawyers didn't want to participate in the book and, you know, um, and how uh, people were very outside the organization were sometimes hostile, which is gone now. Uh, but um, uh, it was true then. So, uh, and when I was coming here like 20 years ago to the UK, I was stunned to read in a Guardian article. Uh, uh, Sherry Blair was then um, at number 10 with, uh, with her husband and she was doing yoga. You know, she was a, mm -hmm. she's a lawyer and she was doing yoga. And um, she was criticized even in the Guardian for being out in left field for doing yoga. This, you know, crazy woman you know, she can't be a good lawyer because she's, I mean, I, I exaggerate only slightly. And this was the guardian, you know. Uh, so I thought, I have to be a little careful here. I'm no longer in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought I've occasionally had since I moved to the UK. Uh, <clears throat> and it's not just the weather in Lowestoft. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, so I decided that I, uh, uh, I would practice at home with Martin. And then I would use the uh, techniques uh, myself. Uh, for example, in meetings, I would listen deeply to people. Um, it's another practice, uh, deep listening. Uh, and uh, I would try and be patient. Uh, I'm not naturally patient, or I would try to be patient. Um, and I would try and demonstrate these things simply by doing them and not talking about them. Mm -hmm. um, and to encourage people to be creative. So, uh, and so then the practices that I came up with were practices uh, about how to uh, creatively engage with the work rather than about meditation as such. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the five-step thing, that's one of them. So it, was, uh, so it was to say, well, how do we think about using law uh, for saving people on the planet? And it was, well, well, let's come up with a simple methodology. So let's start with the science, study that. Uh, let's move into policy and take the science into the policy domain. Uh, and that takes us into thinking about how, what people's needs are, and thinking about the regulated community and thinking about what they're going to want or not want. Uh, mm -hmm. So already you're, 
you know, you're going way beyond yourself. Um, and then uh, in the legislature, let's find um, in the various parliaments, let's find sympathetic people and uh, who share our ideals and then talk to them uh, explicitly about the values that we share um, and then help them achieve their goals. So uh, for example, we were helping to rewrite the fisheries legislation early on. Uh, yeah. and this uh, really quite tough German uh, woman MP was the head of the fisheries committee and we forged a deep relationship uh, by doing doing it that way. Um, and then ultimately enforcement. And I, I see I, I see enforcement actually, you know, bringing cases as um, as a way of making friends. You know, uh, that's an unusual <laughs> way to think about it. But uh, you know, um, uh, we're only bringing uh, enforcement cases to show people how to do the right thing. And um, uh, including when we sued we sued the Central Bank of Belgium two weeks ago. And I saw, no, and you. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. No one's ever sued a central bank on, on environmental grounds before. Um, but anyway, that's that's to help Christine Lagarde, who's running the European Central Bank. Uh, and she wants to uh, do the right thing and have the quantitative easing um, that the EU is doing to refloat the economy after COVID mm -hmm. uh, be green finance. Um, and all of the, um, uh, not all, but some, she's, Got, uh, she's being outvoted by the governors of the bank, other governors of the bank who have an incredibly narrow view of their mandate. We can only look at finance. We can't look at the world. We can only look at finance. We can't look at the world. And um, so we sued the Central Bank of Belgium to again get up to the European Bank uh, because doing it the way they usually do would be over 60% fossil related bond buying. That's not the way to have a green recovery. It's not the green. No, recovery. not at all. Uh, but she can't do anything until she gets help. So. Uh, and we can't sue them directly for technical reasons. So you sue the Central Bank of Belgium to get up to the European Court, to get the European Court to say, ah, it, this must accord with the Paris Agreement. Uh, in which case, if we win that, Christine Lagarde will be at home smiling, saying, great, I now get to do what I want to do, but didn't have the power to do. So that's um, a good example of how litigation can be friendly. Anyway, so by setting up those kinds of structures, I was bringing practice in without talking about practice. Um, and then, uh, and I, I thought, well, I don't wanna just tell everybody that I can teach them environment, uh, I mean, uh, meditation practice, because the last reason you want people to learn meditation is to please the boss. And you know, people around Klein Earth are, are all pretty strong-minded. And I, I, as far as I can tell, they don't do much to, to please, just to please the <laughs> boss anyway, as far as I can tell. But I didn't, that was not the dynamic that I was looking for. But, uh, Three or four years ago, um, people in the London office, Brussels office, and Warsaw office, all around the same time, said, "By the way, we noticed that you meditate, and we wondered if you could share that with us." So that was the opening I was waiting for. And then we had, um, I gave these quite deep seminars in each of the offices, of those three offices, about how to meditate, and that began to change things uh, a bit. And then hopefully, when we all go back physically, we can do more of that. Uh, yeah. During COVID, we've done it online. So uh, oh, people, wow. people have been meditating online. But I, I thought, you know, do it discreetly. Uh, do it uh, by demonstrating what practice actually gives you rather than talking about practice itself. And I think that's worked pretty successfully because I'm really surprised by the, by the open textured nature of the way the climate people relate to each other and the way they think together and think creatively. And just the other day, I mean, we were having a staff meeting Tuesday and um, um, uh, a, a couple of gals were saying, oh, well, we're introducing this new procedure at Kleiner, which is, um, what, what do they call it? Incubator. Uh, the incubator, yeah, incubator. Uh, and uh, I didn't even know we were doing this, you know, but we were doing it. And they said, well, the, and what the incubator is, uh, is a technique for thinking together creatively uh, and we've taken it from Pixar Studios. Uh, yeah. Who have? Oh, you know about it. Well, good for you. You would, Louise. Um, but but he, but here I was, you know, hearing that my people were coming up on their own with their creativity practice, and I thought, well, you know, I can retire tomorrow. This is all. This is this is <laughs> this is good. Ah. Uh, so what are you going to do when when James retires tomorrow, Martin? What are you both going to do? <laughs> I know you're not going to retire, James. We do speculate and, and, and look at sort of remote houses in Provence and stuff like that and both write and there will be another stage for James. Um, and I don't know 
how that will come, whether no, how, how he will shift into it. And, uh, I, and it might be 10 years time yet, but I think there's a lot of teaching he's got to do on that individual level and, um, and time out, first of all, to work out what that is. And, and uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. He, uh, he was um, doing a lot of teaching on how to use meditation for policymakers and things like that earlier on. So when we first mm -hmm. met, that was what he was deep into. And then um, he, we realized he was going to have to move away from that. So I suggested, and he then did write a book called The Field Guide to the Soul, which was really his compilation of his teachings and everything he, he knew up to that point. And um, now going, um, going forward, it's interesting to know what, where will be you know, the point from that? What, what are the individual mm -hmm. teachings? How can, how can we gain confidence in ourselves and, and, and to, to be a part of, of this planet? So I think he'll teachings you know, that way. And uh, I find my own writings keep shifting back into writing about the environment in different ways and uh, different groups of people that are inspiring us in the way that the group of lawyers in Planet Earth has. So I'm, I'm finding other models now and um, looking to, to write books about that. So that's part of what I'm doing in, in accord with James. He's a poet as well, and uh, so a big part of James is is also you know, the James at home who's playing his violin each day, but also writing his poetry every day and bringing out a new collection. He had a new collection out this year called Notes from a Mountain Village. We have a little place in the in the mountains in France in the Pyrenees, and mm -hmm. that for me is where we go when James is consulting with his clients. You're going back to actually take time out with the earth and with the creatures and with the, the elements that, that fly through. We've been going there for 25 years and this is a book of poetry about his his reflections on the natural world from that dynamic of being in this Pyrenean Valley. Um, so this is part of what James will grow. We're an evolving process, I think, with James. <laughs> well, that's, that's the way to be alive, isn't it? Is to yes. continue to evolve. Um, I'll go to some of those slightly more practical questions, I guess, is what I've got in my practical session. Um, so things like, so you, you mentioned China, you mentioned um, the Belgian Central Bank. I would love, and I know that there's now a big organization behind it, but are you, who do you see as the next kind of um, cohort of people or organizations that will need suing? Um, I know you've started mm -hmm. with some, you know, you started talking around pension and pension funds. What else is coming up and how do you choose? Because it seems to me that some of the work again is, is it starts with a case specifically and some of it starts with discussing the policy with the EU or whoever um, at that level. I'd love to hear about what you think is coming next. What's the interesting criteria for next? Well, I mean, three immediately come to mind. Um, so, uh, and this gets back to your earlier question of, uh, you know, uh, do I, uh, now that I'm uh, temporarily a CEO, uh, am I frustrated <laughs> not being able to create things? And, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not because uh, I get to work with uh, team members to, uh, to set up whole new endeavors. So China was one and I have remained heavily involved in that and the strategy there. Um, and uh, the, um, the Singapore office is another uh, okay. which is opening next month, and I'm heavily involved in, in creating that. And, uh, um, and that uh, combines a couple of elements of great interest, uh, which are um, the finance work, uh, which okay. I'll talk about a little, and the, uh, the fossil fuel work, and they, they come together in that work. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the main idea behind the Singapore office was that um, the uh, Southeast Asia is where most of the new coal, uh, well, Asia is where most of the new coal plants would be built and where much of the existing coal capacity is mm -hmm. uh, in the world. Uh, and unless that is changed dramatically and fairly quickly, uh, the, you know, our hopes of meeting Paris Agreement targets kind of go out the window. And I looked around and as usual, there weren't any environmental lawyers involved. So um, I thought, well, we could be involved. Um, and you know we could stop those thousand new coal plants, and we could help shut down the fourteen hundred existing ones. Why not? Um, so, <laughs> so that was the uh, the impetus to start the office. And we've got a couple of big donors to give us startup funds to do that. And you know we're hiring people in Singapore right now. Um, 
And the idea there will be uh, sometimes to use legation, not as easy in a lot of those countries uh, to stop new coal plants. So a lot of it will be policy work. And then some of it will be finance work. So we started this, uh, this whole new finance endeavor about five years ago or so, when we came to the point of saying, well, we've become really quite good at using all of the European environmental laws. We now really have in the team mastery of how to use these. Um, what else can we do? And we were thinking particularly about climate change, but we're beginning to use them now for biodiversity and other things as well, these um, finance tools. And we got to finance because we said, well, if, if we can use all the environmental laws, it struck us that if we enforced perfectly all the environmental laws, even in China and everywhere, um, it wouldn't get, it wouldn't save civilization. It wouldn't stop climate change enough. It wouldn't save biodiversity enough. It just wouldn't do it. Um, even if you enforce them all perfectly, it would help. That's why we're doing it. And it would help a lot if you improve them, which is why we're doing that and then enforce them. But in addition, you really have to attack the finance flows. I mean, not attack, but you have to work with the finance flows. If you're gonna get changed quickly, um, you know, uh, Nick Stearns was saying yeah. something like 15 billion over the next 15 years, a trillion, I'm sorry, uh, has to go into renewable energy. There are various very large numbers like that. Uh, and that's not gonna happen on its own. You know, um, even with the price of renewable energy falling so dramatically, um, you know, our analysis showed that there were incumbent industries that would block uh, for their own self-interest to move to renewable energy. We could go into that very deeply, but it's true, there are incumbent industries that are in the way. So um, you need to do a variety of things. Uh, one is use litigation to remove those incumbent industries, uh, get them out of the road so that the young companies can come through and deliver uh, renewable energy. So we use litigation to do that, you know, attacking the big incumbent industries. But then uh, you needed to, we decided to look at finance itself. Um, so we put together a whole corporate finance team. It's, uh, uh, it's the only corporate finance team in any environmental organization in the world, as far as I know. And it's, uh, it's a small corporate law firm of very, very high standards. And we, we, we sucked in people from some of the world's best law firms uh, who had been doing this for banks, for insurance companies, for companies, and wanted to, as they often say, wanted to move over to the light. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, I never tell them that, but they often say it to me. And um, so this corporate and finance team, quite exciting. We, we started to say, oh, maybe eight or six years ago now, um, something that has now become something that everyone says, which is a great measure of success. We started um, by writing an article in Nature, the science magazine, uh, mm -hmm. arguing that climate change was now so well scientifically established um, that uh, you could demonstrate that it was a risk to all classes of assets. And because climate change was a risk to all classes of assets, it triggered fiduciary duty. So that fiduciary duty had changed uh, yeah. uh, and must be understood to have changed to take into account uh, climate change. Now, um, uh, we wanted a reference point, so we published it in Nature. And now when I show up at conferences, uh, you know, heads of law firms, you know, are giving speeches about how, uh, you know, the fiduciary duty uh, is triggered by climate change and here's how you have to manage for risk. Terrific. Uh, that's exactly what we wanted to have happen. At that point though, at that very early point, we had heads of pension funds say to us, you may be right about climate change. And if so, you're right about fiduciary duty. And we're certainly fiduciaries. We're sitting on unbelievably large amounts of money, but we're not going to do, and do anything about it. Uh, mm -hmm. until you change the rules. We're a very conservative industry. We won't put a, we won't be the first to put our head above the parapet, uh, as <laughs> we frequently said behind closed doors in London. Um, parapets exist mostly um, in, um, in uh, the pensions industry, as far as I can tell. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so they said change the rules and we said, okay, we can change the rules. So it, it took four years of, of work in uh, parliament in the UK but the new pensions bill um, requires um, the risk of climate change to be managed for. Uh, so that's one example of how you change the rules first, and it can take a long time, uh, but then uh, we will go after pension funds that don't do that. And uh, so laggard pension funds, uh, we're, we're looking right now for, if anyone is a member of a pension fund who is doing a really bad job at this, and wouldn't mind being a plaintiff in a lawsuit on this call, let me know. Okay.
uh, because it's it's hard to find people who are willing to stand up, you know, and, and do that. Anyway, so right. uh, so that's that's an example of of where I think action should go. So um, you know, suing banks uh, is part of that yeah. whole finance thing. Uh, we got the we embarrassed uh, the third largest bank in Japan through a shareholder resolution uh, a couple of months ago to stop financing coal. It was the, one of the biggest coal funders in in Asia. So this finance strategy is is rolling out nicely, and we just hired a securities litigator in the U.S. Um, and he's going to be looking for companies who are behaving badly with respect to the concept of coming up with Paris Agreement targets. They're not doing it. They're not disclosing. They're not taking account of climate change. And he's going to be looking for very good targets to sue and make an example of. Uh, now, the companies who are nice guys uh, tell us that this is the best thing we could be doing for them to try and level the playing field. Uh, a lot of the world's best companies actually will want to be doing this, um, but they need everyone held up to the same uh, standard. So. Uh -huh. And I'm seeing that Thomas has just added to the chat that he joined the trustee board of the Unilever Pension Fund today. Ah. And this was the big discussion of the meeting. Um, so there you go, Thomas. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Thomas, if you want any advice from our company and finance team, we give it away for free. So uh, we'd be very happy to talk there to you. There you go. I, I'm seeing him put thumbs up. Great. Yeah. Great. It would be fantastic if Unilever is a company that's in the lead in many ways. Um, and. Uh, uh, it would be uh, very interesting um, if you, you know, have some time to put you together with my team and, and they could maybe give some pointers on. Um, uh, you're probably already doing a great job if you're discussing it at the board level in this way. Mm, that's not so normal. So that's already a very good sign. Uh, it was my, my first meeting today and the, uh, um, the item was the sign off on the carbon strategy. Um, so they were well advanced. Um, but well, that's, that's great. But you know, if you want, we can give you uh, advice on the carbon strategy. And you know, is it good enough? And uh, because there are various things uh, that um, that make it real or less real. And so, one of the other areas to work in right now is uh, is greenwashing. So, lots of companies are coming up with a carbon neutrality statement. Um, and oh. you know, the really good companies uh, will be coming up with uh, with a verifiable plan as well. Uh, yeah. And uh, where you'll have a glide path down to, uh, and you'll be able to measure it and the CEO's salary will be uh, attached to meeting that. And, you know, if Unilever wanted to do that, it would be the first uh, mega company that wanted to do that. And I, you might not be popular for suggesting that, but-, but Oh, I, but think, I, think, I think Thomas has, has gone quite far. If you, they took it to the shareholder AGM in okay. March. Oh, um, and, Tom, and as far as I know, Thomas was one of the, the core people in um, in creating that strategy. So that's it's worth talking about as an example for, for the rest of the world. Yes, yes. Well, so please, I'll, let's do this offline. And uh, okay, you know, that would be you. great. Yeah. I shall connect you. I'm, I'm suddenly realizing that there are lots of questions have built up and I haven't managed to touch all of them. So I'm going to rush through a little bit. And I don't- I'll give shorter answers, yeah. Hmm. No, it's, 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 it's all good. Um, I think it's uh, there's also a lot of comments how fascinating um, hearing you both speak and the partnership you have. Um, so I'm just gonna pick up on a couple of things. Um, Carrie is asking about the emergence of the ecocide laws that seem to be on the horizon in Europe, um, but she's not sure about them. Are there, uh, is there an ecocide law sort of across Europe on that? No, um, it's, uh, no okay. uh, it's, it's, um, it's a concept and a, and a hope that a lot of people have. Um, okay. which would be to bring in uh, a, a law that was parallel to the genocide law uh, for okay. huge damage to ecosystems. Okay. Um, and Kate was asking about how to tackle um, countries where, for example, in South America, they have the legislation, but very, very poor governance. Um, are you thinking about doing anything in there? Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, again, it's, it sounds like the implementation and the enforcement isn't happening. Yeah, so I mean, we spent the last year studying the uh, uh, Brazil and what can be done there. And, you know, okay. um, there was also a high level invitation to go in there from a Supreme Court judge and the woman who was the chief federal prosecutor uh, who uh, invited us to come in and help. And, um, and then we started talking to lots of NGOs, of very smart people who all said, actually, we could use lawyers like you to, to make this work better. So 
uh, stay tuned, but I'm hoping we can help in the Amazon. That's wonderful. Um, I'm going to jump to a question from Jerry that says, um, I worry that the business case approach to sustainability takes out the connect connectiveness that we need with the people who are actually experiencing this sort of firsthand, the devastating impact of climate change. Have you got any ideas as to how to reframe that argument and take account of this? And that could, I was going to say it could be to you, James, but it could also be to Martin in terms of looking at people who are, um, Having been out with the farmers in Poland, I'm thinking, <laughs> but maybe you have an idea. To ask. Well, yes, and the and the islanders, uh, you know, uh, in Australia. But Martin, yeah, a thought. Um, th there's nothing um, comes up straight to me on that one. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I'm interested in where you're going at the moment in looking at the you know, that that broad belt of, of, of the planet. Um, that is going to have too excessive heating, that, that is, is not going to be survivable, that there will be you know, mass exodus from, there'll be wars within, and how do you address that? I'm interested in the approach that, that James is beginning to investigate now over uh, the possibilities of um, laboratory you know, VAT foods. Um, so how do you actually create a, a, a soy substitute in, instead of chopping down the forests in order to be able to feed the the population where they are so so, so building sustainable lives so that's, i know that's a part of james's plan which which answers that in a way because you are you're looking at where are the people with the most acute concern the the, the motto of, of climate earth is for people and the planet is that still the motto i don't know but it's it very much is looking at how we live on on the earth and uh, that, that's right. I mean, one of the things that, that we've been doing, um, uh, so, uh, but to get back to the beginning of the question, um, what, um, what we needed to do was to find a way to talk uh, to companies, banks, uh, economists, uh, decision makers about finance, Christine Lagarde, uh, from, from within the discourse on finance itself, um, because that was uh, clearly going to be the only way to uh, that, that grammar was the only grammar that they were uh, interested in speaking. Um, and uh, I think we are cracking that well uh, with, uh, with uh, company and finance work uh, and all of our partners. Um, and, but your question is a very big question. And um, you know, more and more people are being affected by, by climate change all the time. Uh, and I've started really for the last few years to think of the work as it isn't environmental law and it's not narrowly focused in any way. It, it really is about saving civilization, you know, uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's Huge. what I see my work, uh, you know, is how do you save civilization? Um, and um, so part of it, I mean, uh, I'll just give two, two aspects. Um, one is to do much more human rights work. Uh, so to connect human rights with the environment so people can actually see that um, and we we brought a case uh, for um, uh, islanders uh, off uh, the Australian coast uh, within mm -hmm. the Australian legal system, whose island is being destroyed already <clears throat> by climate change, and it, it's quite clear. And we've hauled Australia uh, in front of the uh, UN Human Rights Commission, and I think we'll win that case. Uh, and that will be one important picture of what's going on, because these are real people, and. These are people who've been there a very long time and their life has been destroyed and the bones of their ancestors are being washed up, you know, when, when they get a high and these unusually high tides. So uh, if you can get those human stories across uh, by bringing these cases, we've now gotten, uh, as another thing we're, we're pioneering really is uh, the intersection between human rights law and environmental law. Uh, and I'm not aware of any other Organization is doing that. We now have 12 uh, uh, human rights lawyers, um, uh, people who have practiced in, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, human rights law as well as environmental law. And the woman who's just taken over the head of Polish office is, uh, uh, was the, uh, the, the chief uh, human rights uh, litigator in the, in the Polish uh, ombudsman's office. So she's a top, top okay. human rights litigator. Yeah, and the idea to, to find that overlap, you know. Um, and that, Sorry, that was, Sorry, Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Just picking up on that, I suppose the one lesson, the main lesson I personally learned from writing the book, 
was from those lawyers in Poland and then going on to Africa. And I'd done a lot of interviews with all the lawyers in, in Europe and in the UK and never come across the term civil society. It just wasn't a current term I found in the UK. And it was why everybody, was, all those environmental lawyers were doing environmental law because they wanted to build civil society to make people understand that they could have a say and they would be listened to. I mean, the story about the farmers packing the court in Gdansk, the, there were these sort mm. of three judges sitting there delivering this case, which was in, in effect, stop putting a stop on the development of the coal fired power station. And they looked up and there were, it was, a, it was a small room and it was packed with 70 farmers and, 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 and their families who had just come in to, to see, is it true that the law could speak for us? It's on our side. And then when I went to Ghana, there were training programs run by Climate Earth lawyers for activists. These weren't lawyers, but they, they were people working out in the field. They were civil society. And what's the story that I like sort of best from them was that the, the lawyers had come up together with something that they called the, the Green Book or the Forest Bible. And they were focused on, 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 on the trees and forest communities. And the laws have been disparate and you couldn't really get a handle of them. So the lawyers had actually created this, this book. It also became an app so that people could, could work out what the laws were. And mm -hmm. they, then they were trained up in how to do it. And I went to these training sessions and different, different activists were leading on different aspects of the law and how to apply it. And they were telling of these meetings that they had had with the government officials. And at the beginning of the meeting, when the meeting was first started, the government officials would bring up an aspect of the law and crush the meeting. They had no reply. Now, the, the, it's the activists that are bringing up these aspects of the law and the, the government officials that were suddenly harried and, and having to run for cover a little bit. They were, they were recognizing that just understanding laws and, and that the, they're, they're your laws and you can apply them was, was powerful. And that's one of the things that we can do, not, not think of these things as separate. This is what lawyers do. Laws are over there that govern our lives. We have to understand these laws because these laws, especially the environmental laws, they're young and vulnerable and fresh and they wilt if they're not applied. So mm. just knowing that they're there and then calling on them, calling the calling them into being, I think is a very powerful thing. And I think we don't think of civil society being under threat in the Britain because we, I know, we, we kind of just feel comfortable and unthreatened, but it is. It, it, oh, everything is Absolutely. under threat, we don't fight for it. And so it's, so I, I from Poland, this, this nascent civil society in Ghana, I, I got the power of, of understanding the civil society and that we must work to understand it, work to what these laws are and see that, oh, we can apply that. We don't just have to buy somebody in or whatever. We have to, we can understand it. So that, hopefully that's what the book does a bit as well. It helps people understand that, wow, these, these are our laws protecting us. Yes. Deeply human thing. That, that, it, it, that's right. I just wanted to pick up the earlier thing that Martin said, just for a second. On the uh, so you're asking about scanning ahead, and uh, one of my big concerns is uh, for the the uh, human beings 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south of the equator um, as climate change uh, continues to kick in, um, and it will, as Martin was saying, it will trigger uh, famines. It will trigger forced migration. Uh, it will be hugely destabilizing for for societies as well as those individuals. And um, you know, I'm uh, I'm talking with the Oxford uh, Smith School about doing a study um, with us on um, what would it take to uh, you know we all know about uh, lab meat that is being worked mm -hmm. on and a tremendous amount of money is going into that and that could be great it could actually disrupt the beef industry and save rainforests um, uh, and uh, take an area the size of uh, Europe and allow uh, it to go away from. Uh, cattle and related production to much more useful things like planting trees and taking care of biodiversity. But what interests me more really, or as much, is what about um, getting uh, uh, an industry going uh, that would be able to produce uh, cheaply and cleanly uh, basic foodstuffs. Uh, so rice flour, wheat flour, maize flour, um, and you know basic cooking oils um, mm -hmm. in pharmaceutical grade labs, in uh, places all around the equator so that as famines come um, and uh, as di these disruptions come, people aren't starving. So you can produce large amounts of pharmaceutical grade basic food um, yeah. and, you know, keep people alive. Uh, 
and reduced the, in the tremendous pressure uh, to the forced migration by, by climate change. And uh, uh, let's put that on our, our list, Thomas. Uh, I, I, I want Unilever behind me on this one. You know? Oh, so you've now both, um, we're, we're at time, but you've both kind of triggered two, two things that I wanted to, to ask you about. One was one of the topics that's um, going on in my, at my dinner table quite a lot is migration because my daughter is learning about it at school, which I was actually thrilled about. But how do we start using laws? You know, I, I still can't see the direct line to how do we help that mass migration that is going to um, mm -hmm. occur with with law. So that's one thing. And and I love that you're coming back with a, a product suggestion for Unilever and others. So let's go do that, Thomas. Um, and, and Martin, I just wanted to stop and pause because I thought your answer was so brilliant about civil society. Um, and I must admit, one of my concerns at one point when I was reading the book was, do we have the time? Do we have the time for individuals to to, to, you know, to bring cases, um, which is why Client Earth is so important in, in taking on these cases and, and scanning for what needs to be done. But we always, in this particular group, talk about what's the action? Um, what is it we could all do? How could we all collaborate? I saw even people were saying, how can we support Client Earth? But, but really, what would be your you know, call to action? I think recognizing the laws, talking about them as ours, hugely important and I loved I loved your answer Martin is there anything else as we send people off into their nights on a Wednesday or, or afternoons for Marissa and others 12 13 years ago when James was coming into Britain armed with all of his skills and expertise and legal stuff from America he was despondent he felt things are going to fall apart no the climate is going to sort of the climate change is, is, is going to kill us all and he, he mm -hmm. saw little hope and then has he then built you know gained more and more tools to adapt change and understood society and how things work and weak points and kind points things like that he began to sort of be more in charge and he became positive so th th there was that that change in him from mm -hmm. and, and i think it's first of all it's it's just accepting that you're not powerless and that, that, that you have some ability to affect change that can be that can be wonderful i think honestly if you can actually just start appreciating some of the things that are around as well first of all so rather than thinking well that's threatened just think well actually that's 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 beautiful or that that's precious or as, as well that then you're beginning to gain power but i, I think it's just finding way just understanding that there are these these ranges of laws or the you know, the decision you've made over what you eat and the packaging you buy and 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 the fact that you've walked rather than not walked and the, and the fact that you've gone out of the house and, and, and walked rather than stayed at home. And the, 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 well, I, I was depressed today, but I took this action to overcome my depression. All of those things are, are, are accepting that you're not powerless. And there might be small steps, but they're steps that you are able to take. And, and, and then those little small steps, they begin to accumulate. If you keep saying, well, I'm not going to be beaten down. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to be defeated. I'm not going to be too upset. I'm not going to cry. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to just be battered by the welter of bad news that I'm finding in my particular edition of a newspaper. I'm going to not read the paper sometime and find something positive instead and finding positive inputs and read our book. <laughs> <laughs> and the other books, by the way, <laughs> and other books. not just this one. <laughs> yeah, all good books. But yeah, and, and, but, but, but go for the positive, the positive stories and, uh, and, um, and just recognize you have a power of, of what it is that you're consuming people that there's a whole welter of people that's saying consume this bad thought this negative this negative emotion this whatever and you, you can say well no thank you and i not for i want to break from that I'm, I'm, and you got the power then to the power of what you consume and, and what you choose to do with your life i'm not sounding like you james or not <laughs> or i'm sounding like you one or the other but, uh, yeah, this, is, this is a good thing and uh, and the other thing I would I would say is you know Kleiner Earth is a family and of course Kleiner Earth is a charity uh, and uh, we have a network of friends and we need friends so we've got a monthly newsletter very happy to share it with you and you know tell your friends and if you want to get involved by supporting the work you know that would be unbelievably great you know uh, remember that high leverage high leverage <laughs> <laughs> what you're doing we'll definitely send the link as well what you're doing is really good you're actually getting people to think more broadly to become yeah. 
and it's, it's, it's you've come out you've come out of lockdown and and you've you've built a whole family and you you bring bringing in inspirational people and inspirational people are listening to them and being inspired and inspiring mm -hmm. and that's all that's all great you know and, and client earth has a remarkable series out of out of lockdown it's it's had a whole series of webinars that i think are available on the web and you can sign up to those and, and hear lawyers talking about the planet and they're guiding you through it they're, the, the lawyers now are communicators they really are so if i'd if i'd been starting this book years ago i would have had countless people wanting to help me it would have been wonderful but they're there now and they're doing it themselves on the web uh, i think this web is a great tool to actually learn about things and well done everybody else there for on, on this early night for, for taking this effort and joining us all it, it's terrific <laughs> yeah, yes i mean thank you for taking the time to be with us i mean it's our greatest pleasure obviously is to share what, what we do and what we love and um it's uh, it's a privilege to be with you all well thank you so much i i hope you just take a, a moment to, to to look at the the comments and the thank yous in the chat if you have a second i think we normally everybody switches on their or off their mute and just to say goodbye and thank you to each other and cameras on if you have the chance if you can bear it just so that we see everybody was actually here yeah, i know quite a few people have had to drop off and just Thank you, everybody, Thank you. again for being part of this. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you very much.